So now, <coughs> now that we have, uh, we have got up to now a way to shift from orbital elements to, let's call them cryptic elements or cryptic variables as you prefer, and we have also gotten explicit formula for computing perfect quantities after an encounter, so we know that we can come back to orbital elements after the encounter. So we, we have a complete description of that. Now let's try to, to do something with that, to, to extract some, some properties of the those encounters. And the first thing I would like to, to, to describe to you is <coughs> is the following problem. We want to find all the initial conditions on the B-plane that uh, lead to a post-encounter orbit of which we impose oh, sorry, the angle theta. We want to have a given value of theta prime. Now, why am I doing that? And the reason is, is obvious if you have in mind the problem of the fields that I uh, alluded to before. Why? Because if, if we had a small body near Earth cluster encountering the Earth at a certain angle, then we said that if the small body passes through a kilo, then it will be shifted to an orbit that will lead to a successive encounter in which a collision might uh, would take place. Okay? In, in doing this, uh, in saying this, we are basically imposing the post-encounter orbital period. Okay? Because if, uh, if we want to have a rendezvous with the Earth at a later epoch, we are basically saying that the orbital period must be such and such. For instance, Apophis encounters the Earth 13 April uh, 2029, and for quite some time, people, uh, including us, have been discussing that there was the possibility of colliding with the Earth on 13 April, at the same longitude, on 2036, seven years after. And the, basically, the only way to do that compatible with the initial conditions was if the apophis would have been if the apophis were put on an orbit making six revolutions while the Earth was making seven. Okay? So we were, by speaking of this keyhole, we are imposing that the orbital period of Apophis after the encounter be in uh, six to seven mean motion resonance with the Earth. So we are imposing the period. So we are imposing the same measure axis. So if you remember my formula, you certainly don't. <laughs> we are imposing the value of theta. <laughs> okay. So, so we, uh, so a, a, an intelligent question to put ourselves is, what if we want to know all the all the initial conditions that lead to a given value of post-encounter theta? Uh, then, uh, remember that theta is between defined between zero and 180 degrees, so only the cosine formula matters, the sine is uh, relevant. So what do we do? We, uh, we rewrite the formula for cosine theta that was this one. Okay. Remember that b squared is uh, xi squared plus uh, zeta squared, of course. We, we impose cosine theta. How do we impose cosine theta, you might ask? Well, let's recall the definition of theta. Uh, in this way, we want cosine theta prime be a certain value. <coughs> we want u is an invariant. This is a uh, fixed quantity, a uh, constant. So we want the semi-major axis that corresponds to the 6 to 7 uh, same, uh, resonance with the year. So we make uh, the cube root uh, of uh, 6 square over 7 square. And that's substitute here, and we get that value. It's as simple as that. Not very complicated. So we go back. Okay. 
So we put that value here. The rest of the equation is uh, just a little bit different form. And we can recast it in this way just by defining D and R. What does it mean? R is the radius of a circle, and D is the displacement of this circle from the origin along the zeta axis. Because you can recast this equation in this form, and this, in this expressed in this form, this is the equation of a circle in the D plane, a circle of radius uh, uh, absolute value of R, centered in Z equal D. So, so this is the answer to our question. Whatever post-encounter orbit you want to come back to the Earth in seven years for Apophis must uh, correspond to an initial condition that is along this circle. Okay? Now, I also like to, to remind that Galileo knew this. Because Galileo <laughs> wrote in the dialogue to I've forgotten the name of, the, of his main treatise. The Book of Universe, it's uh, written in uh, mathematical language, and the characters are triangles, circles, and other geometrical figures. This, is, I think, is a working example. <laughs> OK. So uh, now you, you would ask, uh, really circles? Well, uh, if you remember at the beginning, I showed a figure by Chodas in which there were two keyholes corresponding to a return for a certain asteroid in 2040. And these two keyholes uh, were inclined to one another. So since Chodas was using this strange reference frame, I asked him, please, just rotate your figure, OK, in the way I rotate mine. And he sent me this figure in which this circle is not computed by the theory because I didn't give it to him. It's just fitted to the keyholes he had there and there. And this is the corresponding figure that you draw in one millisecond in the computer just from the form. And you see that at the scale of the figure, they are practically distinguishable. This doesn't mean that they are really circles, of course, if you add all the perturbations. But they are very close. Now, the fact that the solutions of given theta prime are on circles actually shows the way to completely solve the problem of the swing by. That is, given an orbit of given A, E, and I, if you want an orbit post-encounter, also of given A, A prime, E prime, I prime, then uh, is it solvable? I mean, can you decide uh, beforehand what should be the values of C and zeta? And the answer is yes. Well, first, uh, the post-encounter A prime, E prime, I prime will be uh, that they have a relationship to obey that is the conservation of the geocentric velocity. So there is a relationship tied with A, E, and I. And the same relationship also ties among them A prime, E prime, I prime. So it's only a two-dimensional problem. But now, if we also know how to find all the orbits of given final period, then we are left of, uh, with the problem of finding only one chord, which might be either E, because you solve for I using the conservation of the geocentric velocity, or I, because if you impose theta prime, that is, you are imposing the same major axis. So if you want an orbit of given same major axis eccentricity and inclination, you just have to solve the problem. You immediately know how to find the orbit passing through the, uh, the, the, the circles passing through theta prime. And you only have to solve for some place on that circle. Okay? So the, the way you can do it is just re-express xi and zeta using the circle corresponding to the value of theta prime that you have imposed. Okay? And uh, the surprising, at least what has been surprising to me, is that if you do the actual substitution, you end up with this expression, which is ugly to look, but it's linear. You solve it by, by hand. So, uh, so from, from, uh, from uh, computing the values of uh, cosine and sine of alpha, you can compute, compute uh, xi and zeta. And from them, you basically 
going back to the space of orbital elements, you can compute the values of small omega and the longitude of the Earth that you should have in order to have exactly this setup. So within the limits of this theory, which is an approximation, you can, com you can solve completely the problem of the swing by analytically, fully analytically. There is no trial to do. You, you, you immediately know what swing by you have to do to get to certain order. Okay. Okay, so we had enough time to discuss uh, the problem because I, I think all this has been a little, I don't know, in the air. But uh, let's go to a real problem. <laughs> uh, so I, I would like to discuss uh, a bit more uh, the asteroid that was mentioned and discussed by Andrea in the first or second lecture. Uh, because this is an asteroid of which we had to do, we had, we had to deal with, uh, we are still dealing with it uh, recently. It's a, the, the name is 2009 FD. This is a, an asteroid that has been discovered in 2009 uh, during a, a relatively close encounter with the Earth. Not very close, but uh, it has passed relatively close. This asteroid. If you judge it by the magnitude, that is the amount of light you receive from it, you would say that it's very small. But actually, there has been a, a, a recent publication on the data coming from the infrared satellite WISE that says that this asteroid is very, very dark. Uh, and actually, if their, if their albedo value is correct. Eh? This is the darkest object in the solar system. I have to say that I have seen suspicions on this. <laughs> you are not the only one. The albedo of 1%. Yes. Albedo of 1%, I think the, the black hole is uh, 3 or 5%. So this is blacker than black. So to speak. <laughs> but on the other hand, if they are right, and I mean, we, we cannot disprove it, then this asteroid has a diameter of 470 meters, which combined with its uh, geocentric speed uh, makes, uh, I don't remember, a few thousand uh, megatons. It's written, uh, you, you can go into the JPL website and, and find out how many megatons it is quoted in the New York stock market. <laughs> okay, so uh, now this orbit, this uh, asteroid is also interesting because since it has been uh, discovered in 2009, it has been re-observed many times. So we are not at all in the situation in which we have an uncertain orbit, so a big confidence region uh, in which there might be many we are in a totally opposite situation. This is a very well determined orbit, so well determined that actually to have a good orbit solution, you have also to solve for the non-gravitational parameters like the Yarkovsky effect that Andrea was mentioning. Because not doing so would be incorrect, actually. It would not be a good description of what the So, so the <coughs> This, or, this asteroid um, has the possibility, we will see it uh, in a moment, to in, of impacting the Earth between, in the years, that, uh, around uh, the end of the next century. And uh, before that epoch, it has a number of close encounters with the Earth. But these encounters are not extremely close, and so the, the orbit stretches the, the confidence region uh, increases its footprint on the B plane of, uh, let's say, 2185, but slowly. So it, it's quite a, a peculiar case. And uh, uh, so what I will present is an analysis of, of the 2185 B plane. And I, I, I define it a very clean case. What do I mean? Why do I say that it is clean? Well, those of you who followed my lecture in Glasgow might remember this slide, because we are going back just to the origins of the subject. Uh, Andrea has discussed uh, <coughs> the, the line of variation. 
And uh, actually, it turns out that uh, in the middle of the 19th century, Leverrier was doing some work on Comet Lexel, which was morally equivalent. In the sense that uh, the Comet Lexel, if you remember, is a comet that has been discovered in 1770 uh, by somebody called Charles Messier. It's one of the rare comets that has not the name of the discoverer, and there are very few of them. And it usually means they are interesting. <laughs> and uh, for instance, one is, Lex, uh, is uh, Halley's comet, and of course nobody knows who discovered Halley's comet because this took place uh, thousands of years ago. But Halley said something interesting on the comet, and so the comet name. Halley's name was attached to the comet. There are other comets uh, in this situation. One is Comet NK that was discovered by possibly uh, And why is attached to NK? Because on this comet, NK discovered the non gravitational forces, the non gravitational perturbations. Uh, then there is uh, Swift Tractor. As a comet discovered uh, thousands of years ago and swift and tapped on the, the, the orbit. There is also an exception that is Comet Cromwell, which is named by Cromwell, not by the discoverer, and for no reason whatsoever. <laughs> so <laughs> there is an exception to the rule of the exceptions. Anyway, for Comet Lexel, it is named after Lexel because Lexel showed that this comet was on a short period orbit. And not only this, uh, this showed that, but he also showed that this comet, three years before being discovered, was on a totally different orbit that had been strongly modified by Jupiter. And before uh, 1767, it was on an orbit with very large Bernoulli distance. And he also showed that the comet would not be seen again after 1770 because uh, in 1776, the comet, uh, it's uh, the next return close to the sun, would have been on the other side of the sun with respect to the Earth. Okay. And then at the successive return it would have been on the same side, but in between there would be an encounter with Jupiter even worse than the one of 1767, because the comet was in one to two resonance with Jupiter and would have been sent uh, to the outer solar system. So, so everybody started to speak of the Excel comet because the Excel had shown both first that the comet was of very short period, and second that there was this possibility of the planet effect on the orbits of the comets to strongly modify the orbits, really, really shattering it, completely disrupting it. Now, uh, many people studied this comet, and Le Verrier, at the same time in which he was doing his study, which led to the discovery of, uh, of Neptune, he was also, uh, was also studying this comet, and he's, mu he's much more famous for the other work, but this is also not negligible, because he understood that given the observational record that one has, it is impossible to find a well-defined orbit describing uniquely the observations. Uh, you might think that this happens because the comet was observed only for a few days. No, it's not true at all. The comet was discovered on the 15th of June and was last observed, uh, I think, the 3 or 4 of October. So the arc in the sky is very long. On the other hand, uh, you cannot constrain the same major axis to much better than 1%, which is also what is shown here. Uh, so Lex, uh, Le Verrier uh, said that uh, it was impossible to assign a single orbit to the comet, a unique orbit, and pref uh, so he gave a, a collection of orbits, which uh, at, at variance from the LOV described by Andrea, is a segment in this case, and this formula describes this segment. This is a major axis, eccentricity, this one is the inclination, longitude of perihelion, 
I think this is the longitude of the node, but the, the, the notation I, I forgot that I read this paper long ago, and this must be the true anomaly. Any, anyway, so Leverrier studied Comet Lexel and introduced uh, something which was uh, the, the ancestor of the LOB. Okay? Uh, now, sorry, why am I mentioning this? Because all this uncertainty, which reflects in uncertainty on the big plane of the 1779 encounter with Jupiter, is uncertainty that comes from poor knowledge of the orbit. Whereas, I was saying that for 2009 FD, the case is very clear because the uncertainty in the big plane of 2185 comes from the current uncertainty, but all of the stretching around the orbit has been caused by previous encounters. Okay, so there is not uh, there is not any correlation with the observed uh, quantities. The, the, the correlation that there is is all in the, uh, is the fact that it is along the line is all due to the dynamics, which is stretching the, the uncertainty in just one direction. So it's, it's clean in this sense. So let's go back to 2009 FD. This is the situation from now to the end of the, the next century and beyond. You see that uh, uh, we have time on the abscissa, and we have, in the ordinary, we have the nodal distance in red, at, uh, the descending node, I think. And uh, in blue, we have the moid with sign. This is the moid, not with my sign, but with Giovanni Gomez's sign. Which is and this is also the, the two moid, not the approximate one. And this also the two moid. <laughs> <laughs> he always calls his one the two moid. <laughs> <laughs> I must surrender. OK. <laughs> and uh, and the two, the two uh, horizontal lines mark the radius, the effective radius of the Earth. OK? So you see that up to now, we, we are safe because the radius of the Earth is uh, four times in uh, 10 to minus five. So basically, the scale here is from minus 100 Earth radii to plus 100 Earth radii. So now it's uh, 50 Earth radii distance, no problem. But then, as time passes, the node, the, 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 the comet, will, the, the asteroid, will pass through the situation in which the moid allows close encounters with the Earth. And Andrea showed this figure that gives you the consequences on the stretching, on, on, the, on, the, on the semi-major axis of the po po positional uncertainty ellipse of 2009 FD when it encounters the Earth. You see that the units now are, uh, are kilometers on the left, and it's a logarithmic scale. So you see this is the year 2000, this is the year 2200. You see that the, the, comet, the, the asteroid has been discovered here, and as time passes, now the uncertainty is of the order of 10 kilometers in position. It goes up to a few hundred kilometers uh, at the time of these two consecutive encounters in 2063. Then there is another encounter in 2137, in which the positional uncertainty has become of the order of 10 to the 4 kilometers. And then this is the last encounter before the one in which we are interested. The one in which we are interested is the one of 2185. And at that time, the positional uncertainty is of the order of millions of kilometers. But basically, it has grown slowly as a consequence of this succession of encounters. Okay? And so this is the situation now plotted on the Xi Zeta B plane of 2185. And the Earth is there. And uh, it goes from plus 3 sigma to minus 3 sigma. Actually, yes. And you notice that uh, the sigmas on this side are smaller than on that side. And this is an indication that uh, it's the dynamics that does that. Because in the previous encounter, 
there was a position at the encounter took place at uh, about uh, 100 Earth, uh, Earth radii, so twice the distance of the moon. And there was a positional uncertainty of 10,000 kilometers. So it means that one end of the LOV was more perturbed than the other end, which means that the variation of similar axis was greater closer to the Earth than far from the Earth. And the variation of centimeter axis reflects in the different length of the positive and the negative sigma side. Okay. Now, you also notice that uh, uh, the nominal orbit is here, and the Earth is there. Okay. Uh, so, in two uh, apparently, the nominal orbit is very close to the resonance circle that correspond, corresponds to the case in which 2009 FB is put by the encounter with the Earth in the 4 to 5 mean motion resonance. Even if the encounter is very far, why does this happen? Well, because just before this encounter, the orbital period of uh, this object is 1.25 and So you need very little to push it to the, to the exact resonance. And that's, that's why there is this keyhole. And you also see that the circle that is drawn there, that is from the theory, is not very far from, from the actual collision solution. Of course, uh, here, the computations are done with all the perturbations, so you can expect some small variation respect to what the theory says. Uh, so let me make a zoom. And this is a, a zoom. Now you see that uh, we, are, we, are, we have gone much closer to the Earth. You even see the, the gravitational cross-section of the Earth uh, is already visible in this figure. And you notice that there are one, two, three, four, four, five resonance circles that correspond to different resonances listed there. And of course, since the, the LOV passes through the Earth, it is possible a direct collision with the Earth. And the probability of this direct collision is not so high simply because uh, it is at least it is one sigma from the nominal. Okay? On the other hand, uh, the nominal is very close to a resonant return that as such corresponds to a keyhole that has a size smaller than the Earth. But nevertheless, the, this resonant return, given the fact that it's very close to nominal, acquires a substantial uh, impact probability because of that. So you see that this is a, an interesting case. So, how, how can we uh, use the theory to understand what is going on? Uh, and let's go back again to Le Verrier, Le Verrier's paper. Le Verrier not only computed that line of variation, well, actually, he didn't compute. He had a, a set of slaves that were computing for him. <laughs> <laughs> he a very boring job. But what he did, uh, he sampled the LOV exactly as we do nowadays and computed the post encounter with Jupiter, same major axis and eccentricity of, of this uh, comet. And this is just a small excerpt from, uh, a, a small extract from the, this computation, the computation he presented. And you see that there is also the possibility that the comet is sent on a hyperbolic orbit. He showed basically that the comet was, the comet orbit post encounter was very sensitive to initial conditions. Uh, so we, use the same philosophy. And so we, we now try to make an analytic estimate of the range of semi major axis of the possible post-2185 orbits using data coming from the, the, the orbit just before that encounter, taken from an accurate numerical integration. So these are the quantities that enter the theory that we have extracted from the numerical integration. The velocity in, in, the, in units of the Earth's velocity 0.5 something, theta is 97.7 degrees, c is the, the radius, uh, uh, the, the distance at which the object should pass to be deflected by 90 degrees is, uh, corresponds to a quarter of an Earth radius. 
and the gravitational cross section of the Earth is 1.22 times the actual radius of the Earth. Okay? This is due to gravitational force. We only need these quantities to be input into the, the, the formula of the theory. So the post encounter semi-major axis for all what we said before is given by this formula. And in this formula, AB is the uh, semi-major axis of the Earth, U is a constant. So we only have to determine uh, cos theta prime. And we also notice that the maximum of cos theta prime corresponds also to the maximum possible value of A prime after the encounter. And the, minim and the same uh, holds for the minimum. So we plug in there the expression of cos theta prime as function of the coordinates on the B plane. Uh, that is, we are using what we call the wire approximation, which is morally equivalent to what the value was doing, basically. We are keeping xi constant, okay, and only varying zeta. All the rest is constant in this model. If we do like that, uh, okay, Leverrier, a similar thing, and this is a plot uh, done by me, but extracted from his data. This is the post-encounter range of Okay, I did the, the orbital energy because if you want to go to hyperbolic orbits, you are obliged to do like that. And you notice that at the extrema of the LOV, the orbit is very close to the initial one. This is the value of the initial one. Then you have a minimum and a maximum, and then you go back to the previous value. Okay? And this figure changes in shape, but it's a universal figure, basically. The, why? Because if you compute the partial derivative of cos theta prime with respect to zeta, you get this expression, and uh, this is a second degree equation, and the zeros of this uh, uh, deri uh, derivative uh, are given by this simple expression, okay? And if you substitute, you get that the minimum and maximum, pos the maximum and minimum possible post encounters in major axis are reached for this uh, arrangement for these two values of zeta. And you notice that both values are smaller in absolute value than the cross section of the Earth. In other words, the object should penetrate the Earth in order to reach this perturbation, which is impossible. So, what do we do? We compute what are the closest encounters that are possible along the line of variation, so two grazing encounters that take place at zeta equal the gravitational cross section of, of the Earth square minus c square, which is plus or minus this value. So we found two effective values of maximum and minimum A prime, because the real values that would be allowed by the equation are actually prevented by the physical existence of the Earth, okay? And, and so, as a result of this analysis, we conclude that in, the, in 2185, either the comet, the asteroid, hits the Earth, or at most, it could be deflected. If it passes very close on one side or the other side, the maximum post-encounter period would be three years point something, and the minimum would be slightly below three quarters of a year. Can I make a practical comment? If the problem is not impacts, but gravity assist, yes, these are the, the only effective. thing you change in this computation is to add to, to B of Earth a little bit of atmosphere yes. because yes. you cannot pass below the yes. quantity. Yes, but oh, it's then the same, the same computation which is done when you look at planetary trajectory. Yes. Uh, so, why am I quoting these two values? Because the encounter takes place in 2185. We also know that post 2197, the moid becomes large enough that no more uh, collisions with the Earth are possible. So, we are interested on all the possible resonant returns that take place between 2185 and 2197. In other words, we are interested in all the post-encounters in major axis that correspond 
to ratios of the mean motion with the mean motion of the Earth, in which the denominator is smaller or equal to 12. The difference between uh, 2097 and 2185. Okay, and of course, uh, it's well known that uh, there is a Faraday sequence comprised between those two ratios. And uh, it actually, we need the Faraday sequence between one third and four thirds because uh, there are no other low, low fractions in, uh, outside this uh, comprising that range. And if we compute uh, actually this Faraday sequence, which is a trivial computation, there are 43 such resonances. Uh, now, the impact monitoring program has found a total of seven VIs. One is the VI of 2185 plus six more. So out of 43 possibilities, only six are actually found. Why only six? Because of the generic. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I explained that. <laughs> so we can, we can use the theory to do something more. We have only computed abstract possibilities of encounters. But we can do more, because if one has the stomach to read this paper, one will also find the, co the explicit computation of this derivative, okay? And this derivative, uh, this quantity, is the factor by which the z coordinate of uh, on the p plane of 2185 in this case would become by how it, it gives you how much it would be stretched at a later year if there is another encounter, okay? Uh, and this is a function only of u, theta prime. Uh, it's a very simple function. I mean, it's long to expression, but it's so. What can we do? We essentially take the maximum possi possible chord of the Earth, that is twice the, re the effective radius, on the B plane, let's say, of the following year, okay, and divide it by the amount of stretching that there will have been between the encounter and the second encounter. And, and this quantity we know. We, we, we know from this computation. And then to, to, to know, this gives you the, reach, the ratio of the stretchings. In other words, gives you the size of the keyhole projected on, on the B-plane of 2185. To know what is the actual probability of collision, you have to, co to multiply the maximum possible size of the keyhole with the probability density function that you must have uh, somehow. And we have it uh, from the computations that are, that are done by Neil guys, for instance, in cases like this. If you do this computation, you, you get to this figure. Now, this is the z coordinate on the B-plane of 2185. Uh, yes. The nominal orbit is there. This curve is the probability density function. The nominal orbit, of course, corresponds to the maximum of this curve. And are noted in the, by vertical lines the sizes uh, this is the size of the Earth uh, in uh, 2185, okay? It's, uh, uh, sorry, this is the keyhole of 2190. These are only resonant returns. It, the 43 possibilities are all there. The, you don't see them, you see them in the enlargement. The, si the, the height of the, of the bar is the size of the keyhole, and the square is uh, uh, denotes those uh, keyholes for which an actual virtual impactor has been found. And what you discover if you analyze this figure, that <coughs> only those with great, uh, greater probabilities have been found. Some also of low probability, but the point is that our computation with the, with the software are basically complete up to there. In fact, you then wonder why this and this have not been found. N don't forget that these bars are the maximum possible size of the keyhole. And 
in the meantime, there is, a or there is an orbital evolution that might reduce the visible chord of the Earth from the point of view of the virtual impactor. Okay, so we suspect, actually we have not checked, but we should, that these two are not present, not because they are not possible due to this uh, algorithm, but simply because the Earth has moved laterally. But on the other hand, it is impressive that the theory gives you a good agreement between the, 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 the various probabilities and tells you that there are other, if you want a, a higher level of completeness, you might expect to find other collisions. Of course, when we, we are going down there, the probabilities are becoming 10 to minus 8, 10 to minus 9, they are less, less uh, interesting. But uh, the point, uh, and this is my conclusion, the point I would like to stress is that this theory allows you to, to have some deeper insight on what is going on and have a geometric understanding. basically square root of 3 minus the design. But, but, but then you have a Jacobi constant. So that yes. means that you, you, your planet is in super orbit. Yes, I, I say that okay. in the meaning. Sorry. Uh, so uh, that, that may be the reason why somebody would say for a general applicability for the flyby uh, targeting problem, or maybe it's just completely I would never use this theory to do actual computations, just to isolate the regions in which you do the numerical integration. Then you have, in any case, other perturbations. Of course. Then you have to add other things. But if you have an idea of where to start from, you save a lot of computation. These are kind of the nonlinear computations. From a good starting approximation, this computation will be used as a starting point. To give you an idea, the computation to go from now to 2185 over 2,400 uh, virtual factors takes some time in the computer. The computation of those bars is a spreadsheet. It's nothing. So, but of course, you can't uh, trust that it got, just gives you an indication. Then you have to do the rest of the work if you want to be sure. Do you know if the sentry system also uses this? Um, do you know if the sentry system at the JPL also uses this? Analytical approach to um, isolate the areas where to look for uh, keyholes? No, 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 no. They use the same approach as Neo dice, basically. The only different sampling, perhaps, and they are uh, they, like very well secret. All these papers are written in collaboration with people in this type of sampling. We do this on purpose yeah. because we think it's reassuring for, for the public to <laughs> know that we agree. <laughs> okay. So on the liberal that you can the same mistake those papers you need to describe the things to do which are in common sometimes you say there is a small technical difference but they are truly that's that's the worst feeling it's, 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 it is the same but it's, we use an automatic identity which is a brute force to extend the computer you need a one day of CPU multi core system and then but then you we use uh, this kind of argument to understand what we're seeing. Um, I just uh, wanted to ask one question if I can understand this from, let's say, a dynamical systems point of view, the model with the circular orbit of the Earth. Um, would I be correct in understanding the B plane in this sense to be like a Poincare surface of section with a return map more or less being constructed by? We are working on, on making it a, a map. The point is that it's somewhat, it, it's, it's a map that resembles, would resemble, for instance, Wisdom's map, uh, a mixed variable map in which you do the propagation in Keplerian elements and you do the perturbation in some other elements in this case. Yeah. Elements. But the, the, then the time step is not, is, is not fixed, absolutely. May, may I reveal one problem? I'm sorry, I entered my transparency, but I didn't have the time to explain it. The problem is, unlike the Poincaré map, the Poincaré map is a canonical transparency. Now, this the B plane is not 
a sympathetic uh, a Lagrange manual, that is the p-plane cannot be described by canonical variables. There is a theorem that shows that this is impossible. So you you have a map, but this is a map of the plane, the plane, but this map is not a cell, which is enormously annoying. We have not found a solution. Okay. Done. Uh, could you show the plot about the position, the position uncertainty of just uh, Uh, yes, so um, if I understand it correctly, this is the uncertainty for a, uh, for, for a virtual impact which is propagated for a virtual impact from the line of variations, right, of the... This is the semi-major axis of the position ah. uncertainty ellipse, okay. once propagated to the... To the um, I, I was wondering uh, why at some point between, the, between 2064 and... 2003, there's like a, a drop there, which is particularly. The, the point uh, is that uh, the, the point is this is only a partial, partial information because you are only plotting space information and not velocity information. It's not a complete set, so you will theory and doesn't only for this. If you only take a part of this, doesn't work. Of course, when the positional uncertainty diminishes, the velocity uncertainty stretches. Okay. If this is your question. Yes, you know. Thanks. Okay, let us wait a moment. We assume 20 minutes in order to speed up. The one dimensional projection. Okay.